Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, Clomid or Clomiphene, and more specifically, N-Clomiphene, which is an isomer of uh, Clomid or Clomiphene that I think has some very advantageous properties. Um, I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive than um, what I've seen on a number of other YouTube videos on uh, Clomiphene and N-Clomiphene. Uh, specifically because uh, I, it's a fascinating substance and I think it has a lot of potential. So if you are, especially if you are a young man who is suffering from low testosterone, uh, this, this may be the ideal agent for you. And I wanna go into that in detail for you guys today. So I hope you enjoy this. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you are aware of the fact that there's good data going back now many, many decades that testosterone levels are dropping in men uh, around the world, mostly in the Western world. But, um, you know, this is a global phenomenon, obviously. But what isn't being talked about this as much as I think it should be is that this is also affecting, you know, not just older men. We typically think of low testosterone as something that creeps up on men in their middle age and maybe later years. And perhaps in the past, that's that has been the case. But... Um, there is now an epidemic, kind of a silent epidemic of low testosterone levels and subfertility in younger men. And this is a paper here that talks about that. Um, this is from the uh, European Association of Urology 2020, decline in serum testosterone levels among adolescent and young men in the USA. Um, this chart pretty much tells it all right here. We'll talk about this. So. This looked at testosterone levels and a, no, a number of other markers in young men, average age between 26 and 27, going back from uh, back to basically 1999 to 2000, and then looking at them, uh, you know, similar groups of men over subsequent years. So you have 99 to 2000, 2003 to 2004, 2011 to 2012. You can read it here as well as I can up till. 2016 and presumably this trend has continued into the present day i just don't have that data here to show you um, so let's look at this a little bit let's let's cut to the chase here so let's look at mean testosterone this is total testosterone in the nanogram per deciliter uh, range so in this group of uh, men that were roughly average 20 age 27 uh, back in 1999 to 2000 Mean total testosterone, 605.39. So, you know, right there, right in the middle, re reasonably good. And then with every subsequent check, you know, down the road here, uh, we see that this number is dropping. It goes to 567. And then in 2011, 2012, we cross into the 400s, okay? And then the most recent one here in 2015, 2016 shows a mean of 451. Um, quite low for an average group of, of men age 27 in my opinion so the question is all right what you know what is causing this and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit um, what it, what's scary about this though is if you look below this uh, this is the, I highlight I highlighted this in green for you guys and it was the number of men or uh, we'll talk about the percentage of men from these groups that were uh, you know, overtly hypogonadal, meaning in, in this particular case, they had documented serum total testosterone levels less than 300 nanograms per deciliter, which, you know, is generally accepted as the definition of hypogonadism. So back in 99 to 2000, only 4.35% of the group that they sampled qualified for that, for the, diagno the diagnosis of hypogonadism. Fast forward to the last uh, generation here, or last you know cohort we'll look at the last two essentially yeah so in 2013 2014 that number jumped up to 20.7 percent we'll say 20.8 percent of the group was overtly hypogonadal and then that trend continued in 2015 2016 and as far as i know that number has remained roughly stable it's probably slowly increasing so we went from four roughly four percent being overtly hypogonadal um right around the uh, 2000 and then now we're up to like over 20 percent so that that's a little bit a little bit scary and um there are studies going along with this that show similar declines in uh, semen quality sperm counts etc so we're seeing fertility decline as well 
So the point of this talk is not to go into the whys of that is, but uh, to talk about one of the options out there that can be used to treat these young guys to help them. So, um, and that's where on paper Clomid looks like the perfect drug, and you'll, you'll see why as we, as we go in here. But unfortunately, it's it's not um, for a variety of different reasons that we'll talk about. Um, but what also is not ideal is putting these young men on lifelong testosterone replacement therapy. In my opinion, it's not appropriate in the vast majority of cases that have um, secondary hypogonadism. So, just to make sure we get our defini definitions out of the way. Primary hypogonadism is when your testicles are no longer have the ability to produce testosterone. Typically that's irreversible. So you have a primary problem in the testes. Um, you know, maybe you've had trauma. Uh, you know, maybe you've had testicular cancer. Maybe you've had radiation to your pelvis uh, from a prior malignancy. Uh, the, the list goes on. Basically the factory is closed and doesn't matter how much signal the factory gets, the factory's not waking up. So those men, obviously, they we're not going to be able to induce additional testosterone production out of them. It's sort of like you know beating a dead horse is, is what that is. So those men, they need to, they do need to be on um, testosterone replacement therapy. That's that's their that is their only option. Okay, and so you know young men, reg well, regardless of their age, even teenagers that have primary hypogonadism are going to need exogenous testosterone. But that's not what we're talking about in this particular case. We're going to be talking about the treatment of secondary hypogonadism in young men, and that is typically a problem at the level of the hypothalamus and or pituitary gland where the signal to the testes is inadequate. The testicle itself generally is capable of producing more testosterone, but the signal from the pituitary gland, specifically LH, and in terms of sperm production, it's FSH has been dialed down for one of a million different reasons. And that's where, where again, on paper, Clomid works by increasing FSH and LH, increasing the signal, you know, waking up the testicles, so to speak. And so on paper, it seems like it would be a fabulous, a fabulous choice. But regardless of that, I, you know, I still hear about young guys in their 20s that physicians have started on testosterone replacement therapy. And Many of the ones I've talked to have never heard of Clomid um, or, and have certainly never heard of n um, And many of them, quite honestly, never were counseled about lifestyle changes. They never were counseled about weight loss, uh, avoiding endocrine disrupting compounds, all of these things that they can do on their own. And they were just put on testosterone therapy, which I think is really, I think in the vast majority of cases, a bad idea. Um, you know, when a young man when any man really commits to testosterone replacement therapy, they, they're committing to lifelong suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Now, it may not be working that great in the first place, but it will be completely suppressed. Um, unless they are taking HCG and or recombinant FSH, or perhaps HMG, they're committing to uh, basically ongoing infertility. Because as we all know, testosterone, unopposed testosterone therapy Shuts down testosterone, or shuts down sperm production, and leads to infertility. So that's that's a major problem for a young man who's in his 20s. Even if he doesn't know if he wants to have children or not, um, you know, may may lose that ability. You know, and that's you know, I hear some of these clinics saying, "Oh, well, you can just go to a sperm bank," and and you know that that is not a great option in my opinion. Um, you know. The, the quality of your sperm that's frozen degrades over time. You, you can't keep sperm frozen necessarily f for 20 years and expect it to be just as good as the day that you produced it, okay? So I, I personally don't think that that's a good option. Um, and the fact remains that, again, many of these young men, these young men with secondary hypogonadism, they have a reversible cause for their low testosterone symptoms and reversible in terms of um, modifying their lifestyle. So many times it's a combination of poor lifestyle, which includes poor sleep, poor dietary intake, lack of exercise, um, you know, low vitamin D sometimes, and quite frankly, most common one is obesity. So, um, you know, ideally you could correct those and restore testosterone levels to the point where they're no longer symptomatic, whatever that might be for that individual. And there's good data showing that weight loss alone um, you know, can restore testosterone levels in obese men. I'm not going to get into that. We'll do, I'm going to do that in another talk. Um, there's studies looking at men who've had bariatric surgery and have lost like 100 pounds of fat. 
their testosterone levels go, go up, they feel better, their uh, sex drive improves, their erectile quality improves, everything gets better, okay? So um, having said that, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about how Clomid works. So I mentioned it only works for men with secondary hypogonadism. So again, a, a problem at the level of pituitary and hypothalamus. So um, clomiphene is a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, of which there are several other ones on the market. Uh, the bodybuilders I know out there, I know you guys have heard of tamoxifen or Novidex. Um, there's also raloxifene, which is used um, in, in primary care and in the OBGYN world. Um, for those of you who don't, um, or are not familiar with what the HPTA axis looks like and where exactly clomiphene uh, works, this is the axis here. So what really matters for in terms of clomid um, and in clomiphene is happening on the right side of this little diagram here. You can see that when, when the testes produce testosterone, a certain amount of that is aromatized into estradiol. Um, estradiol has an inhibitory effect at the level of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, which lowers LH and FSH. So what happens, clomiphene comes in, it essentially blinds the hypothalamus to the presence of estradiol. The brain says, oh, we do not have enough estradiol in our system. How do we get more estradiol? Well, the only way we can really up our estradiol is to up our testosterone. So how do we up our testosterone? We start producing more LH and also F FSH comes along for the ride um, as well. So on paper, this is great. So that's essentially how, how uh, clomiphene works. Now, it, it didn't come onto the market for this purpose. Clomiphene came out in uh, the late 60s, I think it was 1967, as a way to treat female infertility. And my, my first interaction, my first prescriptions for clomiphene that I wrote many, many years ago and when I was practicing family medicine were not for the treatment of low testosterone or subfertility in men. They were, um, they were exclusively in, uh, in women to assist with um, getting pregnant, so it would help them ovulate. So I was actually, I was very familiar with clomiphene um, and I used it, it, it was actually it probably 15 years after I graduated medical school that I first prescribed clomiphene uh, to a man. I, I didn't even know, they didn't even tell us in medical school that you could use clomiphene in a man. It was exclusively um, taught to us as this is a drug that you use for uh, female fertility. So that's why I assumed that it was. What, I, what they also didn't tell me uh, until much, much later was that it, uh, clomiphene is two drugs, okay? It's two isomers that are put together. And interestingly enough, they both have very, very different properties. And as I'll get into in this talk, it's the differences in those two properties that I have that I think has a lot to do with the side effect profile of clomiphene and why for a lot of men it, uh, it may work initially and then sort of stops working or why they just don't quite feel as good on clomiphene as they do on testosterone, you know, for example. So uh, yeah, so anyway, clomiphene, uh, it's composed of two isomers. So there is the trans isomer, which is uh, N-clomiphene, and then there's the cis isomer, which is zooclomiphene, okay? And when you get, um, you know, a standard clomid tablet, it's going to be approximately 38% zooclomiphene and 62% N-clomiphene. But again, these are two they, they should, in my opinion, even though I'm going to show you how close they are chemically, they really should be thought of as different different drugs because they behave very, very differently uh, in the human body. So these things, um, they are isomers. So what the heck is an isomer? So th this <laughs> is a little quick organic chemistry lesson for you guys. So there are cis and trans isomers. In this context, cis and trans has nothing to do with the phenomenon going on in our culture, um, which I'm not going to get into. This is purely an organic chemistry term, and it has to do with the placement of various groups around a double bonded uh, molecule here. So the, in, this, in this particular diagram here, they're highlighting the hydrogens, but we could just as easily look at the methyl groups here. If they are on the same side of the double bond as they are here, it's called a cis isomer. And if they are on opposite sides, trans to each other, they're on the opposite sides of the double bond. So you, what you have essentially, you have, you have two molecules here that have an identical a number of carbons. They have an identical um, number of hydrogens. But as you can see, the way that they are shaped is very different. 
And this has this changes their properties radically. Uh, these bind to receptors differently. They have uh, different melting points and can often have other very, very different, um, different properties just by taking these groups and putting them from one side of the double bond over to the other side of the double bond. So that's your organic chemistry lesson for the day. <laughs> All right. So the interesting thing about clomid, because it is a serum, um, it acts as both an agonist and an antagonist at the estrogen receptor. And there are two estrogen receptors that matter in this particular case. There's the alpha and the beta. So this is an article here that talks about it if you wanna read more about it. Um, it's from the Endocrine Journal 2010. Clomiphene citrate elicits estrogen agonist slash antagonist effects differently via estrogen receptors alpha and beta. Just to cut to the chase, when it comes to the beta receptor, which is the one in the hypothalamus that matters for what we're talking about today, it is a pure antagonist, meaning it blocks that. So it prevents actual real estradiol from binding onto that beta receptor. It's not gonna happen if uh, clomiphene is there. It, it takes up the space, but it doesn't stimulate it. It just blocks the binding of estradiol. Now, the alpha receptor, which is not that relevant to what we're talking about today, um, it, it does bind to the alpha receptor, but very weakly. So in some ways, when the estradiol levels are very high, if you have a little bit of clomiphene floating around, it, it sort of blocks that alpha receptor to a certain extent, just because it gets in the way of the estradiol binding, which, which estradiol has a much higher affinity. But if the estradiol level is quite low, then in that case, it, you will see an estrogen effect. So it binds to the alpha receptor, just not very well. Again, that's not that important for this particular talk. This is much more relevant um, in, in female infertility, but you may hear people talk about this, how it's both an agonist and an antagonist. Um, what really matters for, for men is its antagonistic properties at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Okay, these are the two isomers. And, and, and this, I love this picture because it really shows um, how, how similar zooclomiphene and enclomiphene are when you, when you put them on paper and you look at their chemical structure. I had to kind of do a double take and be like, what's the difference here? And you can see, I put in this blue arrow here. This is all it means is um, this little ring here, carbon ring is flipped over to the other side. So it becomes cis and then it moves over into the trans position, okay? And when it does that, it's, that's enclomiphene. And then if it's on the, obviously if it's in the cis uh, conformation, it's zooclomiphene. So very similar looking molecules as, but as I'm going to show you guys, vastly different clinical effects. Okay, so zooclomiphene, the cis isomer, is mildly estrogenic. So it does bind to the estrogen receptors, kind of like I mentioned before, and has a very mild estrogen effect. Enclomiphene does not. Enclomiphene blocks the estrogen receptor, and that's all it does. It blocks it, but it does not activate it. Hmm, maybe enclomiphene is something we should be looking at a little bit more closely, right? As I'm going to talk about here, when you give enclomiphene, pure enclomiphene, you do get a rise in gonadotropins. You get LH and FSH, they rise because, again, they're blocking estrogen. But if you just give zooclomiphene, you actually get the opposite effect. Because remember, it'd be, it's sort of like giving a very weak, watered-down estradiol. And what does estradiol do to the axis? It lowers FSH and LH. And so you get these anti-gonadotropic effects from zooclomiphene. So, so, you know, clomiphene is this, it's this drug that really is two drugs that are sort of working against each other. One of them, the enclomiphene, wants to raise testosterone levels ultimately. And zooclomiphene, because of its mildly, you know, and weak est estrogen-like properties, will, uh, you know, tend towards lowering testosterone levels. And all of this is mediated through LH and FSH. So these two things are competing against each other. Now the enclomiphene, at least initially, wins out because it's, uh, it's, there's, there's more of it, right? So it's, there's over 60% um, enclomiphene in an average, uh, you know, clomid. Uh, tablet. But as we'll see, the tables get turned as uh, you go on in therapy for months and months and, and years. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that. It has to do with, uh, with the half-life. So, so for men, the only part of it that you're interested in is the enclomiphene part. The zooclomiphene part, as we'll talk, I'll show here in a little bit, um, 
is probably responsible for the majority of the negative side effects that men experience. But if you're a woman, you 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 don't want to take enclomiphene if you're trying to induce ovulation because you need the zoo, the zooclomiphene portion of this is what helps stimulate ovulation in women. Um, so why why has clomid been so popular? Um, well, quite frankly, it's because it works. Um, at least on paper, it seems to work well in terms of elevating men's testosterone levels. So this is um, a journal, uh, International Brazilian Journal of Urology from 2012. 25 milligrams of clomiphene citrate presents positive effects on the treatment of male testosterone deficiency, a prospective study. So what they did is they gathered a whole group of men together. I think it was 125 of them. Um, average age was 62. And that, this, is, this will be interesting. I, I'm going to comment on that here in just a second. Um, and they put them on 25 milligrams of clomid every single day, which is a very standard protocol that you'll see. Sometimes you'll see clomid um, and enclomiphene, for that matter, doused every other day. But typically, a daily dose is, is, is what you'll find, uh, um, especially in most of the studies that are out there. And then this is the chart here that showed what the effect was. So this is the average in, in this group of men. Um, they started with an average serum testosterone level total of 310.27. And then three months later, they were up to close to 370. So that, that's a pretty decent elevation in testosterone levels, certainly high enough potentially to resolve symptoms, um, you know, maybe in, not in all men, but, you know, looks, it looks promising. There was no significant change in total cholesterol, no significant change in HDL cholesterol, because that was a concern, you know, with, for these researchers is, um, you know, are we going to, you know, potentially harm these men by, you know, worsening their cardiovascular, you know, lipid profile? It doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and then prolactin, no significant effect there, as well as with fasting glucose. So, so they got a nice bump in their testosterone level. Now, this is what's interesting about this group of guys. So, you know, the average age, as I mentioned, was was 61, but they had a, you know a whole range. And typically, um, you know, what I learned years ago when I was being trained in this sort of thing was that. You know, clomiphene might be a good option for younger men, but you know, really, like once you get past the age of 40, and certainly after the age of 50, um, you know, the the testes just don't respond as well, and and that is true, but it doesn't mean that they don't respond at all. And according to this study and a few others that are out there, I mean, just because you're an older man, doesn't mean that you couldn't potentially consider this. Um, so when they broke these men up into different age groups. So the guys that were 30 to 50 years of age, um, by the way, they all had, you know, relatively low, similar low testosterone levels, like 335 to 296. So they were all kind of in the ballpark, you know, they, by any objective measure, these guys were low. Um, the young men, I mean, not surprisingly, the young men had the biggest boost in testosterone. So almost from 329 up to 800. Uh, and I've seen that myself in clinical practice. So obviously it helps. It's good to be young, right? You get a more robust uh, LH response and you get a much more robust testosterone response uh, to that LH. And then as you get older, you get less of a response. But look at these guys over 70 or 71. And even the guys in the 51 to 70 group, I mean, they still got a reasonably good response, you know, which is, you know, again, likely to be sufficient to resolve or at least improve some of their symptoms. So so this kind of shows that just because you're an old just because you're an old fart doesn't mean that clomiphene uh, is is off the table necessarily. Um, again, most men would pr probably prefer to be on just regular testosterone bioidentical testosterone, but um, if for whatever reason they decide to go this route, um, you know, it's it, the evidence shows that it, it would still work for you. So at the end of this study, what they did is they, they took these men and they asked them this simple question, did this treatment improve your symptoms based on sexual complaints? And you can see that the men that had these uh, elevations in their testosterone level on clomiphene in the green, overwhelmingly positive, they, they had uh, improvement in their symptoms. And that's, again, like I said, that, that, at the end of the day, that's, that's what matters. Okay, let's talk about side effects. Now, this is, a, I think this is a case where the medical literature doesn't always jive with what I've seen in, in clinical practice. I'll talk about that here in a second. What I mean is um, that the side effect profile seems to be downplayed a little bit in, in the medical literature. And what I've seen in, in general practice has been a little bit different. And I'll explain what I mean here in a second. This is from the British Journal of um, 
Urology 2012, clomiphene citrate is safe and effective for long-term management of hypogonadism. Um, and they followed men out for um, over three years and they looked at their testosterone levels and a number of other factors here. So this is the chart, baseline and follow-up hormone levels, year one, two, and three. And you can see, you know, their baseline levels were objectively low. Um, they had a nice, you know, increase in testosterone that first year up to 612. And then it kind of leveled out, you know, the next, you know, year two and year three, they were in the mid to upper 500s. Uh, their LH level uh, elevated as you would expect and it stayed elevated. So, okay, so far so good. They did have some uh, mild to modest elevations in estradiol uh, as would be expected with the rise in testosterone levels and their um, Adam score improved. So uh, the, the lower your score, the better with the, with the Adam score. So you can see that you know, it, it remained below their initial baseline of seven. And it's interesting though, the first year it was down to three, and then in subsequent years, it bumped up a little bit to five. Now there could be a lot of different reasons for that. I have a theory about why that is. We're gonna get into it here in just a second. Uh, and then finally, you know, their BMI improved, which is always good. It started at 32 dropped 31, 29, 28. So they had ongoing improvements, presumably in their body composition um, as well. So when they talked about um, side effects on here in this particular study, and they quoted some other ones uh, as well, you know, the side effect profile, the overall incidence of side effects was stated to be fairly low. So they quoted a number around 9%. Um, so mood changes at 2.3%. Uh, visual changes 1 to 1.8 percent. Now the visual changes, that's something that, that gets a lot of press and it can be a little bit frightening. I, I've, I've seen this in one particular patient. It can be kind of variable, be blurry vision, uh, shimmering or flashing lights, like photophobia and like uh, a prolongation of the after image. So if you, you know, turn and you know, the image will kind of follow you. So kind of like weird stuff that is thought to be related to um, you know, blocking the estrogen receptor uh, at the retina. Now the ophthalmology literature on this, they kind of downplay it and say, well, it's probably not a big deal. You can generally kind of wait and see if it goes away. You know, it, that makes me nervous. And I, th I know a lot of physicians that feel the same way. They tip, this is typically an indication to discontinue therapy. That makes me, you know, vision is important, so it, it makes me nervous. I, I, the one time I saw it in a patient, I had them discontinue it entirely. Um, so other side effects, breast and nipple tenderness, 1.5%, weight gain, 1.3%, and then acne was listed at 0.5%. My theory, and I'm gonna explain why I think this is true, is that the majority of these side effects are due to the zooclomiphene isomer and not the enclomiphene uh, isomer. These are things that you see with estradiol, including the visual changes, by the way. So if you look at the uh, IVF in vitro fertilization literature, um, where you know sometimes women are given um, high doses of injectable estradiol, uh, this is a, these visual changes, the exact same things that you hear with clomid, your clomiphene are, are documented and are talked about extensively in the fertility literature uh, as a side effect of high estradiol levels and some of the other agents that they use in the IVF world. It would make sense that the zooclomiphene, which has estradiol-like properties, is probably the culprit there. I can't prove that, but I have a feeling that it, that it is. So time will tell. We need to do more, more studies on this. A little bit more on clomiphene. How does it compare to TRT? This is from the Journal of Urology, Testosterone Supplementation versus Clomiphene Citrate for Hypogonadism, an age match comparison of satisfaction and efficacy. Okay, so they took a whole bunch of whole bunch of guys, they put them either on clomiphene, they put them on injectable testosterone, or they put them on the standard like 1% androgel uh, topical therapy that you know your doctor might prescribe to you out of their family practice office. They measured their levels and they, they looked at their symptoms and they basically they just saw how they did. So in terms of testosterone levels, what we saw, not surprisingly, is that the men on injectable testosterone had the highest serum testosterone levels, uh, up to 1,014 nanograms per deciliter. And then uh, as confirmed in other studies too, the men on clomiphene um, seem to have a similar rise in testosterone to men who are on the topical, you know, 1% androgel cream. So in this case, the, um, the clomiphene men uh, increased their testosterone from 
247 to 525, and then the TGL group uh, increased from 230 to 412. So uh, obviously injectable testosterone is, uh, is obviously gonna give you the highest testosterone level uh, with the other two kind of tied for second, uh, I suppose you could say. And then not surprisingly, I mean, the estradiol level was higher with injectable testosterone because the levels were higher, it aromatizes, um, et cetera. Um, the average testosterone, uh, or sorry, the average estradiol level on men on it with injectable testosterone was 60 picograms per ml. And then with uh, clomiphene and with androgel, it was approximately 20. So it's not surprisingly. Um, but here's the interesting thing. I, I say this a lot. You know, levels don't always correlate with symptoms. And this is a really important take home point. So the men in this group, you know, the injectable T guys, obviously they have the highest levels. So you would think, oh, they would have the most symptom relief, right? Not necessarily, okay? Not necessarily. This chart here shows the different groups and the, uh, the red is the testosterone levels that they achieved, okay? So obviously the injection group was the highest, and then you see the, the TGL and the clomiphene citrate pretty close to each other. But when they gave them this Q-Atom score, quantitative Atom score, which is different than the regular Atom score, um, with the Q-Atom score, you want, you know, the higher the score, the better you're doing. That's a here in blue. So yeah, the, you know, the injectable T guys did have the highest Q-Atom score, but look at the T gel and the clomiphene group as well. I mean, they, they're right up there. I mean, they're pretty darn close. This was not considered to be statistically significant. So they didn't attain the same testosterone levels as the injectable group, but they had a very similar improvement in overall symptoms. So, you know, I don't want to get too off topic here, but this, this just shows you that for a lot of men, there, there's a symptom threshold you know, whereas where when your levels dip below that, you begin to feel poorly. But when you get above that, you you start feeling better, obviously. But then you don't continue to just keep feeling better and better and better as your levels go up and up and up. In fact, the opposite might happen. So once you, your goal of therapy should be to get above your symptom threshold, whatever, and, and using the lowest possible dose. You just wanna get just above that symptom threshold. You're good to go at that point. You don't need to keep pushing the dose higher and higher. Um, necessarily to get relief of your symptoms. So I don't want to digress too much on that, but that's, I think that's a really important point and it shows it you know, pretty elegantly here. They even say it, it says, this suggests that super physiologic testosterone levels do not directly correlate with decreases in hypogonadal symptoms. Symptom resolution may be a better guide than serum testosterone for evaluating the efficacy of TRT, or TRT in an individual. Yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. Absolutely. You go by symptoms, you don't necessarily shoot for a specific level, which unfortunately, I still keep hearing about these clinics that have these level, oh, we gotta get you to 900, we gotta get you to 1,000. And um, I think if you hear that, that's a good, um, it's a good clue that you're maybe dealing with somebody who doesn't truly understand testosterone therapy. So, okay, I don't wanna to get too far off topic here. Let's get back to zucomaphene and enclomaphene. Let's talk about these two isomers, how they're different um, in terms of their uh, pharmacology and pharmacokinetics. This is a really good study with mice uh, that will, I think, show you guys what I'm about to lead into here. Um, this is from Advanced Techniques in Clinical Microbiology. The isomers of clomiphene citrate have dissimilar dispositions once ingested. Yes, they do. Um, so this is a 2017 study. So. <clears throat> To cut to the chase here, they gave the different isomers to mice, they measured blood levels, they looked at the different tissues, like where the, where the drugs, you know, distributed, et cetera. And what's relevant here is, well, the, probably the most important thing to, to note is the half-life. So enclomiphene has a very short half-life. It's 10 and a half hours, very, very short. Okay, it very potently stimulates testosterone production, as we talked about before, by blocking um, the estradiol receptor, the beta receptor up in the hypothalamus, and it also stimulates sperm production, uh, as they talked about in this article. What's interesting, though, is that the, uh, the cis isomer, zuclomaphene, it sticks around a really long time. So enclomaphene, half-life 10 and a half hours, half-life of zuclomaphene, 30 days, 30 days to 
to, to have one half-life, okay? So, and you can see this here. This is the chart of uh, serum levels in the mice. This is after just a single dose. So one dose of enclomiphene, within four hours you hit your peak level, so it's really high here. And then look at this, 24 hours later, I mean, you're down to like, to nothing. In 72 hours, it's essentially gone. Okay, but one dose of zuclomiphene, you don't reach the high peaks that, um, that you do with enclomiphene, but um, you peak here at four hours, but look, 24 hours later, still have a solid level there. 72 hours later, you still have a solid level. Five days later, you still have a detectable level. So this stuff, it sticks around a very, very long time. And, I, and this is where, I think this, is, this, this has clinical relevance in my opinion. We, we need more studies to really prove that. Um, because on long-term Clomid therapy, remember you're taking two different drugs. You have one drug with a very short half-life and one with a very long half-life. And the one with a long half-life is gonna to start to build up. And it's gonna to start to build up and it's gonna to start to build up. Okay, and potentially you can have some issues from that. So we're gonna talk about that. So in this particular study, they showed when they gave the mice the low dose of the zuclomiphene, it didn't have too much of a negative, it didn't have a, a profoundly positive or negative impact on their LH, FSH, and testosterone levels. They just kind of like hung out. But when they started going up into the higher doses, they went up to as high as 40 milligrams per, kilo, per kilogram per day. They had profound suppression of LH and FSH and testosterone levels, and they had testicular degeneration and arrested spermatogenesis. So it's basically made these mice infertile as they went up to the high levels of, of zuclomiphene. So pretty interesting. And, and, and then I'm gonna read you the conclusion from the study, which I think is, is, uh, is profound. So it says, um, the present study suggests that an unopposed high dose of zuclomiphene can have pernicious effects on male mammalian reproductive organs. The deleterious effects seen when administering zuclomiphene in male mice justifies the case for a monoisomeric preparation and the development of enclomiphene for clinical use in human males to increase serum levels of testosterone and maintain sperm counts. Absolutely. The zuclomiphene is potentially problematic. So, um, let's talk about that a little bit more. So this was in mice. Now, uh, obviously, you know, mice are a good model for most things, but they're not perfect. So does this happen in men? Do, do, do you get a buildup of zuclomiphene in, in, in human males when you take clomid for a long period of time? And this study says yes. Okay, this is journal of sexual medicine, serum levels of enclomiphene and zuclomiphene in men with hypogonadism on long-term clomiphene citrate treatment. This is back in 2016. So not a huge study, but they took 15 men. They had them on 25 milligrams a day of uh, Clomid. And um, they basically followed these guys out for just over two years. And they checked checked a number of different biomarkers and, and serum levels. Uh, but they looked at the levels of enclomiphene and zuclomiphene over this, this period of time and, and got some very interesting findings. And this group of guys, it was, this was young men. So age 36, they were, uh, they were obese, average BMI of 32. Um, all of them had documented low testosterone levels. So on average, they had a to serum total testosterone of 205, which is pretty damn low. And over time, over this two year, you know, two year period, it was actually 26 months, um, their average testosterone increased to 488. Their free testosterone had a, a nice response, 6.3 nanograms per deciliter up to 16.3. And then they had a modest increase in their estradiol, 17 picograms per ml to 34 picograms per uh, ml. So, all right, here's what was interesting. Now remember, uh, Clomid, Clomiphene is 62% enclomiphene and 38% zuclomiphene. So again, every time you take a Clomid pill, you're, you're not quite getting twice as much enclomiphene, but you know, we can, we can round a little bit, okay? You're getting twice as, you're getting two parts enclomiphene, one part zuclomiphene every time you take a clomid pill. Just think of it that way. So you would think, if we didn't know what we already know about these half-lives, that that's kind of the ratio that you would maintain in your serum levels if they had the same half-life. But what happened? Okay, at the end of these 26 months, average enclomiphene level was 2.2 nanograms per ml. So kind of low. Average zuclomiphene level, 44 nanograms per ml, 20 times higher. So the ratio more than inverted. So these guys had 
relatively low levels of enclomiphene, but over this period of you know roughly two years, their zooclomiphene levels just kept going up and up and up, and were were, were twenty times higher than the enclomiphene levels, despite the fact that the product they were taking was sixty two percent enclomiphene and only thirty eight percent zooclomiphene. So. Um, very, very interesting. And there was another really interesting part of this study too that I think, again, I think this has, this explains a lot. For whatever reason, in these men, um, their N-clomiphene levels were very predictable. So 80% of these guys, their N-clomiphene levels were under four nanograms per ml. So they kind of clustered. So the level of N-clomiphene was very predictable. It was very uh, roughly stable um, in all of these men. But their zooclomiphene levels, we know that they were high, but they were all over the map. Some guys had really high levels. One guy's level was 109, and other guy's level was 27.6. Vastly different levels of zooclomiphene in these guys. Um, and here's my theory, is that that might explain why clomiphene works really well for some men and not for others. So if you are a man who accumulates zooclomiphene, maybe because you have some sort of genetic polymorphism, um, over time, clomid is going to work less and less and less well for you. If you are perhaps a fast uh, excreter of zooclomiphene um, and you keep your zooclomiphene levels in check, uh, like this guy who had a level of 27.6, maybe, maybe you'll do better. Maybe you won't have some of these side effects that we talk about in the literature related to what I think is probably from buildup of zooclomiphene. So it's pure speculation on my, on my part. We need a lot more studies on this, but I, I found that that was really interesting. The enclomiphene levels were very steady, very predictive. The zooclomiphene levels in these 15 guys were all over the map. So, and, you know, wildly different, wildly different. Okay, let's talk about enclomiphene a little bit in terms of, um, you know, how does it work to raise testosterone levels in, in terms of efficacy? Pretty good. Um, just as well as clomiphene does uh, in terms of the numbers. So this is uh, this looked at just within the first 15 days of how you know how quickly the LH and um, testosterone levels will go up. Um, so uh, in this particular group, so they looked at guys that took 12 and a half milligrams a day, 25 milligrams a day, and 50 milligrams a day. They had um, very similar starting testosterone levels between 220 and 255. And then by day 15, you know, not surprisingly, the higher the dose, the higher the testosterone level, the 50 milligram group within 15 days went up to, we'll say 590, the 25 milligram group went up to 520, and then the 12 and a half went to um, 411.5. And so, yeah, they got a, you know, they got a decent, decent rise. Your best bang for your buck, by the way, is you're probably gonna end up being the 25 milligram dose, either once a day or every other day generally once a day because of the short half-life. You, you know, you don't get that much extra juice for the squeeze when you go up to 50 milligrams. So this is just my personal preference. I typically start guys at 25 milligrams a day because I've seen some really good results with that. If you look at the free testosterone, which is just below that, you get a similar, you know, improvement. They started off with free testosterone levels in all three groups of, you know, around the nine area. And then they increased 13 We'll call it 16 and then 18, depending on which dose of enclomiphene you, were, you got. So it works. It totally works. Um, does it affect other hormones? This is the effect of enclomiphene as compared to topical uh, androgel, the 1% cream in terms of DHT levels, which, uh, so the androgels here in the white, not surprisingly, use a transdermal bioidentical testosterone. You get a little bump in your DHT levels and you get a little bit of a bump in DHT as well with uh, enclomiphene. Again, just because you're increasing the testosterone levels, but it's not quite as much as you'd get with um, with the androgel. What about side effects? Um, this is an excellent paper. It goes into a lot more than just side effects. So if you want to read one paper on enclomiphene citrate, this would be it. Uh, it's called Expert Review of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Uh, enclomiphene citrate, a treatment that maintains fertility in men with secondary hypogonadism. This is from January of 2019. The conclusion here, initial studies demonstrated that enclomiphene maintains the androgenic benefit of clomiphene citrate without the undesirable effects attributed to zooclomiphene. Okay, so side effects from 
uh, and clomiphene, very mild and not considered to be statistically significant from placebo. So what they mentioned in this particular study, headaches in 3.3%, na nausea in 2.1%, diarrhea 1.9%, nasopharyngitis 1.7%, hot flashes in 1.7%, arthralgias 1.2%, dizziness in, in 1%, um, identical to placebo. So at least in this particular study here and some of the other studies that they quote in here, the side effect profile of n pretty good. Pretty good. Does n or clomiphene, um, okay, does n does it affect any other hormones? Because we always want to know, you know, the hormonal system is very complex and intertwined, and if you start monkeying around over here, you can have effects over here that maybe you didn't intend to have. Um, so it's important to look at that. This is a study from the International uh, British, Journal of Uro uh, British Journal of Urology. Um, 2013, testosterone restoration using n citrate in men with secondary hypogonadism, a pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic study. It's another good one. Um, I'll cut to the chase here. This is the, the a big long chart here of all the different markers that they looked at. n had no effect on other hormones with the exception of um, it lowered IGF-1. That there was a statistically significant change in IGF-1. This is the chart here that shows that. Again, all of these studies, they, they like to compare like 1% androgel, which is crap, to uh, n -clomiphene. So transdermal testosterone, you see what it did here to IGF-1. And then they call it androxol. That's going to be the brand name for this if Big Pharma ever gets to sell it. But Androxol is the same thing as n -clomiphene. And they looked at the different doses, 25, 12 and a half, and then 6.25. All of them reliably dropped um, IGF-1 levels. The clinical significance of that, of which is uncertain. Um, so just FYI, if you do follow your labs regularly, you might see a drop in your IGF-1 level, okay? Uh, but in terms of it effects on TSH, cortisol, ACTH, your lipid panel, um, these markers here, osteocalcin, these are markers of bone turnover, because there was some concern that, you know, oh, maybe, you know, are we going to give these guys osteoporosis if we're blocking the estrogen receptor? Um, and turns out, no. In fact, there's a lot of studies showing that you can actually improve bone health and bone mineral density in men uh, with clomiphene, but it's not an unreasonable thing to be worried about. Um, but based on the studies, it's not something I'm terribly concerned about. Okay, how does it work with uh, raising FSH and LH? Not surprisingly, you get a nice big robust LH rise. Uh, this particular chart here shows over the uh, course of eight weeks. The most important one here is this uh, red box. This is the 25 milligram dose, which I think is probably optimal. Uh, but even the 12 and a half obviously works. And then the, the little triangles down here are, um, this is again topical testosterone, which as we know, is gonna lower your LH levels over time. I'm surprised it didn't lower it even further uh, than it did here. But regardless, you get a nice big LH uh, surge here and it goes up, it peaks, looks like it peaks around uh, 15. And then by eight weeks, they got a, a level, you know, roughly around 12. So it will kind of hover around there. I Now in, in clinical practice, I don't have permission from my patients to show you these labs, but I've seen LH levels surge like way past the upper limits of the reference range. Um, I've seen LH levels 18, 19, 20 uh, in, 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 some, in some men. And they had a very robust testosterone response <laughs> from the enclomiphene. So it, it certainly works. And this is FSH. So when it comes to fertility, again, with the 25 milligram dose, get a nice, nice response here. Um, very brisk. Uh, again, I've seen levels the FSH doesn't go up as much, but the LH I've seen really get quite elevated in some in some cases. And again, this just, just goes to show, not only are you preserving testicular testosterone production, but you are also maintaining fertility. There's other studies on fertility, just in the interest of time, I didn't want to get into all that stuff, but um, you, you will maintain and you know potentially potentially enhance fertility uh, with the use of n which which is great. Okay, so who, Who's a good candidate for n -clomiphene? If you are a young man with secondary hypogonadism, again, not primary, this is something that I think that you should, and you're symptomatic from your low testosterone, whether you're, when you have genuine hypogonadism or you just have a level that's, 
you know, low enough to be symptomatic for you. Um, I think enclomiphene is something you should talk to your physician about and sit down, have that discussion about whether you think this might be an option for you. It's best used in men that have a either a low LH or FSH or like a mid normal LH and FSH. If your LH and FSH are already at the top of the reference range, um, probably not going to be terribly effective, right? We don't have we don't have a lot of more room to move there. Um, so if you have a low low medium LH and FSH, you're probably going to do better than somebody that that has a higher one. Um, I think this is a really good option, in particular for obese young men, because this will raise testosterone. In those young men, it will make them feel better. It will improve their fertility. But most importantly, it's going to give them the, the testosterone boost. That perhaps it will improve their energy, their mood, their drive to get off their butts, get off the couch, dust off the Cheeto dust, put down the game controller, and get to the gym and get motivated about changing their lifestyle. So how do I use this? I use this as a relatively short-term bridge as a way to help men get through that you know initial symptomatic phase to allow them to improve their lifestyle and lower their body fat with the goal that we can hopefully restore their natural testosterone production they can come off of enclomiphene and, and then continue to do well but it's hard when you know when you're obese you have low testosterone you're fatigued you're tired your motivations in the toilet I can yell at you all day to get up and go to the gym, but if you're too tired, um, and because you're suffering from hypogonadism, and it's it's going to be an uphill battle. So, enclomiphene I think is a perfect drug to use for maybe, you know, if you've got a hundred pounds to lose, which a lot of guys out there do, getting on enclomiphene for one to two years as a way to help you get your body fat under control, make the lifestyle changes that you need to make, make the dietary changes, start exercising then I think, I think it's good. And then maybe at that point you can come off of enclomiphene. You can see what your baseline levels are. You can see what you feel like and then take it from there. Because again, I, I, far too many of these clinics are just going straight to TRT for these guys. You know, there are other options and sometimes I feel like they don't even talk to them about those options because these windmill clinics, that's how they keep their doors open. They're, they're testosterone mills. They make money um, selling you testosterone. But there's major negative side effects or major negative consequences to getting on testosterone when you're a young person. And so I try to explore all those other options before pulling the trigger um, and going ahead and doing that. And I think that's, um, I think that's the right thing to do. So I'm gonna conclude here with a, with a quote from that article, the, the last article that I just showed you guys, and it's talking about enclomiphene. So it says, ideally, this therapy would become the primary medication for men with secondary hypogonadism who wish to preserve spermatogenesis. Men who do not desire children of their own do comparably well with testosterone replacement therapy if they are willing to accept the suppression of natural sperm production. That's true. However, many men with secondary hypogonadism would be good, good candidates for enclomiphene. With, with obesity being closely related to secondary hypogonadism, you guys know I talk about this. And with obesity rates rising, the number of younger men with secondary hypogonadism who would desire to preserve fertility is increasing, okay? So if you're a young, fat guy who wants to stay fertile and doesn't want to get on lifelong testosterone therapy, and clomiphene, it might be, that might be something to consider. Have that conversation with your doctor. Um, I hope you guys found this helpful. Uh, if you have experience with either clomiphene or uh, enclomiphene as a patient, please let me know. Um, the majority of men that I've seen on, on clomiphene do well initially, and then they don't do as well. Their mood is worse. They don't feel good. You know, things start to kind of, the wheels start to come off. I generally see it like around six months. The, they just, something, they're just like, there's something not quite right here. My theory, based on what I've shown with you guys today is that this is because the zuclomiphene levels are rising, okay? Um, I have yet to have a guy have those complaints with enclomiphene, okay? Knock on wood, we'll see. It hasn't been around that long. I don't have as much clinical experience with it, but uh, that's been my experience is that men do much better on enclomiphene. They feel good. 
And that feel good uh, feeling tends to maintain uh, over time, okay? So uh, I would love to hear your experiences, guys. If you have experience with, with either one of these agents, please uh, reach out to me, let me know, and I will talk to you guys next time.